Hello and welcome to Cup of Joe. A little bit of story time today. I want to tell you about the history of the mocha. Where that name comes from, why a mocha is called a mocha and all that sort of thing. Uh, but before I get into that, I just thought I'd share with you a little bit of what I'm drinking right now. So what I brewed up today is Anchorhead's Guatemala El Tesoro. It's actually in this month's Coffee Lovers box. Uh, so if you're curious, I call it Cherry Cola. It's got this like cola-like sense to it, which is pretty interesting to have in a coffee, like a little sparkly, but this kind of dark, and it's cherry, this dark like cherry cola juiciness. And I actually, I brewed it up on the V60. So if you've been following me for a while, then you know that I really like the Kalita Wave. And uh, I have all these other brewers. <laughs> I have so many other brewers. Uh, I play around with them from time to time, of course, but uh, I had been enjoying the Wave so much that I just kept using it. And I finally came to the end of all of the filters that I had for the Wave, which meant that I pretty much did like 300 brews of the Kalita Wave in a row, sprinkled with a couple other things in there, like the Chemex and the Aeropress and the V60. But I decided that I maybe I'll dive into the V60 and try it out. So I was playing around with this today. If you're not familiar with the V60, this this is a V60 cone. It's a, it's a bit different than uh, some other cones you might be familiar with. It's an actual cone. It doesn't have a sort of a tapered thing. And it's got some other stuff. I'm going to play around with that and find a really good process that I enjoy. One of the things about the V60 brew method is that there are so many variables to it. Uh, and that's what I'm finding as I'm tinkering with it at the beginning. Grind size and quantity and how you pour the water in there and all these sorts of things uh, affect the final brew, uh, which is a bit different than the Kalita, which is a little more straightforward. But I'm going to tinker with it until I find something I really like, and then I'm going to make a nice brew guide for it. So uh, that'll be coming before too long. All right, so the mocha. Coffee as we know it has been, well, coffee as we know it is, as a brewed beverage has been around for about 600 years. You've probably heard the legends, uh, some of the early legends of coffee, especially the one with the goat, where the goat farmer, goat herder, saw his um, goats getting all excited and then he discovered coffee, blah, 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 from Ethiopia. So it's, it's, it's widely accepted and understood that coffee's origin is Ethiopia. And if you go there now, you see coffee just grows wild there. It doesn't grow wild really anywhere else in the world, but it grows wild in Ethiopia. If you look at, at all the like genetics of coffee that we drink, most of the coffee grown in the world can be traced back to a single plant. But if you go to Ethiopia, there are tens of thousands of varieties of coffee that have much different variations to them. That's all just kind of a little background. Point is, coffee originally came from Ethiopia. Then at some point, it ended up going over to Yemen. And that's really where coffee started to take off. There was a group of monks in Yemen that drank the coffee in order to stay up so that they could pray more. Uh, and that is kind of where it started catching on in popularity. And it grew from there, and for a couple hundred years at least, where coffee came from for the rest of the world was Yemen, and it came from the port of Mocha. And you might stop there and you might think, okay, that's where the name Mocha comes from. That's just part of the piece. The port of Mocha was the biggest trade center of coffee for the world for many, many years. And the coffee was seen as such a valuable commodity that it was illegal to take any of it out of Yemen. You couldn't take trees, you couldn't take seeds, you could export certain green coffees and roasted coffees and that sort of thing. But they didn't want to lose the hold that they had on the coffee trade. And then as the story goes, the Dutch ended up stealing a coffee plant, taking it to Java. And that's where you end up with the word Java, so that's the other one of the other origins of the world trade of coffee. And then you had the Mocha Java blend, which was a combined, which was a combination of those two. Uh, and from there, it went to Europe. And then we had the uh, Noble Tree, which was a gift to the King of France. And then from that tree, the rest of the coffee uh, got spread around the world. And that's where most of the coffee comes from. That's grown like everywhere else in the world come from that one tree. Um, but back to Mocha. So for something like 200 years, it was 300 years. I probably should have written down the dates. The port of Mocha was infamous for its coffee. People really wanted that coffee. Uh, but as it got spread around the world, people found that the taste didn't quite reflect the legend. So they wanted the taste of the Mocha coffee, of the Yemen coffee, but they weren't getting it. And the, the natural taste of the Yemen coffee at the time was that of chocolate. And if you have like really good natural 
uh, single origin Yemen coffees, you can see the rich sweetness of those coffees is unbelievable. So I can imagine going back in time, people trying to replicate that and being really frustrated. Because uh, if, if you took any other coffee in the world right now, almost anywhere else in the world, maybe some Ethiopian coffees grown in the right way can match, but they, nothing quite compares to a single origin Yemen coffee. And, and I think one of the main reasons for that, not just the varieties that they have, but it's coffee there is grown at such a high altitude and in such extreme environments, the plants are really stressed, et cetera, so they become more sweet. So going back in the day, uh, as coffee was starting to spread around the world and people were trying to get that same mocha experience, they couldn't do it. So they added chocolate to their coffee to replicate the chocolate flavor of the natural mocha coffee. So thus, creating a mocha was adding chocolate to your coffee to make that original mocha. So that's where the name mocha comes from. That's why a coffee with chocolate in it is called a mocha. Uh, I think the whole story of that got lost at some point. People just kept calling it a mocha. It'd be interesting to dig around and kind of trace the whole history of it. It's really fun to see the origins of these names and why uh, things are called the way they are. Next time you're drinking a mocha, know that you're drinking a very interesting piece of human history. I'm gonna share a bit more in some other videos on history of coffee like this, especially in Yemen. Uh, it's really fascinating to me uh, seeing where all of this stuff comes from. And uh, especially as I followed uh, my friend Mokhtar, uh, who you may have heard me talk about on the videos here, but we also featured him in the magazine when he was at the beginning of his journey. Uh, there's a book that's, that's being published, that's coming out uh, at the end of this month, January 30th, called The Monk of Mocha, which is all about Mokhtar and his journey. And um, it's a really, really awesome story as he, he has, spent the last several years of his life going to Yemen, trying to revive Yemeni coffee, uh, because the history, the history of Yemen, especially the Port of Mocha as it comes to coffee, is really interesting. If it were not for those people there, then I don't know if we would be drinking coffee now. Something to think about. I'll link below to that book if you're interested, and also, of course, the Coffee Lover's Box. You wanna grab that, that's only available until Friday, so. Um, get your hands on it while it's there. Thank you for watching and I hope you have a great week.